friend of mine called me on the phone and said, the state's having a sale of, of old marble. Um, would you like to come and look at it? So we went over there and he bought me a big pile of marble in exchange for me making him a head for his garden. And so my first experience carving marble was with a sharpened screwdriver and a, and a hammer and I carved him a head for his garden, but I liked, this is Vermont marble and this was rubble left over from the, um, ex from the addition of the wings to the Capitol. And Norma Paulus uh, was presiding at that point over the Historical Properties Commission or committee. And she, um, she had this marble sale and this was the way they raised funds to do just what you folks are doing and to purchase portraits. Anyway, out of that came the idea that I should make Mark Atkins portrait. They called me and asked me if I could, if I would look into it and I did and so we arrived at a price which was too little and, but which I, you know, I met the deadline for the price and there it is. While I, I sat with Mark Hatfield and measured his face and we discussed authors in common, what I do remember is that at the time I thought his mother's influence was so great and I thought, see, I thought that was a positive thing and I think people can, can spin that negatively but at that time I thought that, that, that that connection, that maternal connection was strong enough that I wanted to include his, um, his, that connection in the, in the narrative of his bust and originally I had designed, a, uh, a designed the piece so that the, this pillar was sitting in a in a, in a dish, and I wanted it to be, you know, a, a dish of his mother's china, and I actually got the dish of his mother's china to, to duplicate. As it turned out, this marble is very old, and, and it was having a really hard time holding the detail I wanted to, to give it, and I, um, I couldn't get it to hold the rim of a dish standing out and proud of the surface, so I had to leave that part out. I tried to make the composition speak for what I learned at least about the public man that I think Senator Hatfield is is, is an authentic scholar and um, I mean I think he's authentically a scholar I think he has read a lot and I think he has the breadth of mind to to incorporate what he learns into his own larger picture so that's where the books come from um, I, I just I'm sad that I didn't get to hold on to the plate because in years to come that that would be very interesting you know that would be something that would be nonsensical that, you know someone might discover later and it might add depth to the piece as a sculptor you have a visual vocabulary and a lot of things are shaped like other things you learn this vocabulary of shapes and intersections well at the time the whole vocabulary around a shirt and tie and lapel was completely foreign to me um, and it's a new vocabulary for me. I was good at faces and, and nude bodies and, and uh, so I, I, I had these pictures of this lapel and I had no sports jacket or tie or, or shirt in my, in my personal wardrobe. Um, and at the time, one of the obvious people and one of the only people I, I really knew and, and was friends with um, was David Roten, who, who had you know, a, a selection of suits and ties. So I'm working on Senator Hatfield's bust late at night and, and I'm at these things and there's some questions I had to solve. So I call up David and drag him out of bed. He went, he went straight to his, his wardrobe and pulled out a sh shirt and, and, and jacket and tie and sat on a stool in his kitchen and modeled for um, an hour and a half's worth of drawings while I explored all those shapes. We had to put uh, Senator Hatfield's head on it. And actually, there were troubles. Um, there were passages in the stone that were having a really tar hard time holding detail. Old marble that sits out for a long time begins to rot. And this, this piece of stone had, had aged to the point where there were some fragile areas. And I couldn't, uh, you know, I just couldn't hold on to as much depth of detail in certain areas that I wanted to. So I, did, I didn't get, um, for instance, I, I didn't get quite the, um, the power out of his eyes that I had intended to because I really couldn't undercut the eyelid as much as I'd hoped. And that gets those dark lines, but it would have, um, 
it would have fallen away if I tried to undercut it. And, you know, I couldn't have that. So I struggled hard. It was a big responsibility. I wanted to do a good job. Um, and, I, and I worked really hard at it. I knew I was equal to it. I, I'd done similar things before in, in stone and in, and in wood. And what was his reaction? You know, he was very polite. You know, he took my hands and, and looked at my hands and said, well, now, now I and felt my hands and wanted to feel the hands of someone that carved stone. He was curious about that. I think he liked it. At the onset, there was some trepidation on the part of Jerry Frank, who, who didn't want to trust the task to me and wanted to, I think he wanted to hire someone out of New York or, you know, someone that was a, a lot more proven than me. In the end, I think they, they knew they got a decent job. Um, and I think that everyone is probably satisfied, al although none of the principal parties involved have ever contacted me since. So I don't, you know, I don't really know.